biggest asset, but huh. they cannot take that away. They can take my house away, they can take my car away, they cannot take my reputation away. And ultimately, that's where really the value is in it. Even they took my name away, but it didn't matter that's because amazing. people know that I'm doing other things. Yeah. They will follow that and, be, and they trust when they know that I'm producing it, I'm making the product, people, because of the reputation, trust that the quality will be good. And that's, that's, there's a tremendous value in that. That's something that can never take away. Welcome to episode number seven of the Rose Bros podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Rose. Centered around a cup of Rose Bros coffee, my goal is to share the stories and life lessons of other entrepreneurs, athletes, and interesting people in general. Today, we are joined by Bernard Calabo, a renowned fourth generation master chocolatier and entrepreneur. Bernard has had a long list of rewards for his chocolate, including a few of the following. Winner of the Best Milk Chocolate Bar at the 2013 International Chocolate Salon Awards in Los Angeles. Winner of Best Chocolate Boutique at the 2013 Top Choice Awards in Calgary. And Silver Award at the 2015 International Academy of Chocolate Awards in London. Bernard was the first North American to be bestowed the honor of l'Ordre de International de la Gastronomie Française, recognized by the French government for outstanding contribution to the culinary arts. As a perfectionist who is passionate about his craft, Bernard is always focused on the balance of taste and style. As a result, fellow chocolatiers, chefs, and gastronomes around the world revere him. Also, people may not know this about Bernard, but he has two previous chocolate companies that bear his name. The first being Barry Calabo, which is one of the largest chocolate companies in the world. Barry Calabo has 17% of the world's production of cocoa beans, a market cap of $17 billion, annual revenues of $70 billion, and is listed on the New York and Zurich Stock Exchange. The second company, Bernard Calabo, which he ran for nearly 30 years, at its peak had annual revenues in the millions, hundreds of employees, and was an internationally recognized brand. It's hard to believe, but I don't think a lot of people know that about Bernard. In this episode, we talked about starting over, one of Warren Buffett's favorite investments, experience on Dragon's Den, and a lot more. I hope you enjoyed the show. Bernard, welcome to the show. Thank you for sitting down. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I know you're a busy guy, so I won't take too much of your time today. <laughs> no, no problem. Just I'm always busy, so the, <laughs> you know, but there's always something happening. How did you get into the chocolate business? I'm, I'm literally born into it. Our family had a chocolate business in, in, in Europe, in Belgium. Our house was across the street of the chocolate factory in Europe. It's not uncommon that family business have their house beside the factory. So I'm literally born across the street of a chocolate factory. So my great-great-grandfather started that in 1911. We were brewers before, 1850. So it's the second generation that got into the chocolate business. My dad took it over in 1945, just after the Second World War, and mm -hmm. run it till 1972 when he passed away. My mother continued until 1980, and then we sold it. We were specialized in really bean to bar. That was our specialty because in the chocolate business, you have different types of businesses that you can do with chocolate, but really we were specialized in making bean to bar. So we would deliver to industrial clients. My dad came up with the invention to deliver chocolate liquid, what at that time was a no-no. So uh, large consumers that would use 10, 20 ton a day, like cookie manufacturers, ice cream manufacturers, uh, melting 10 or 20 ton of chocolate a day is mm -hmm. quite a job. So they preferred delivered li uh, liquid. So my dad came up with the idea to deliver it in a tanker. It looks like an, uh, a gas tanker and that is heated with water around it like double boiler system. Pump the chocolate in the, in the tanker and then drive it to the client simply pumping and they can use it immediately what eliminates a, a step that takes a lot of energy because before you had to 
molded in bricks, and that's a massive cooling tunnel that you need for that. Right. And then the client has to melt it again. Yeah. We cool it, then they heat it up again. So that was that whole step was eliminated, and it became more cost effective too. So your family is originally Belgian? Yeah, yeah. I'm born in Belgium. I studied there. I studied for engineering, <coughs> electromechanical engineering. That, but ultimately. The chocolate bug got me. So when we sold the business in 1980, I decided to continue in the family tradition. And I went to work for one of our clients in Antwerp, where I did a, an apprenticeship. And then I decided to come to Canada. And so I opened my first shop in 1983 here in Calgary. Called Bernard Calabo. Yes. After yourself. Yeah, I had that company for 27 years. And what was the name of the original Chocolate company? The Calabot. In Belgium, Calabot. The company still exists. When my mother sold it in 1980, a Swiss fellow bought it. He bought it and then he bought a little, uh, like about 14 years later, he bought our biggest competitor, a French company, Coco Barry. They were in the same bean to bar business as yeah. we did. And he amalgamated the both companies. So the company is now on the New York Stock Exchange and the Zurich Stock Exchange under the name Barry Calabot. And Barry is a, fr- a French last name. In North America, it sounds like an individual, Barry Calabot. But ultimately, it's a publicly traded company. They are actually the largest producer today in uh, chocolate in the world so they take 17 percent of the world production in cocoa beans so they are a massive operation yeah but the family is completely out of it we have no connection with them actually i don't work with them Uh, i work with a a different company that is more specialized in organic because that's you know we are 95 percent organic in our operation so when your mom sold that business did they get the recipes you know it's a more knowledge-based business it's like selling a restaurant if you're gonna sell a high-end restaurant recipes mean nothing if you don't have the knowledge really the knowledge then you cannot run a restaurant right recipes are not that important it's the knowledge that is important like in our business like go in the high-end food business Mm -hmm. it's a knowledge-based business marketing i would imagine a lot of but marketing of is always part of the the puzzle you no know, like you you can you can sit in your shop and have the the best product in the world yeah. but if you if you don't market it nobody knows about it uh, marketing is a definitely a big part of doing business definitely in in our article like consumer article uh, yeah. there's there's no doubt that yeah. marketing is a big problem now having said that in our business it's important that you have the quality of the product and the marketing together. Right. Often what you see in the food industry is that you have the marketing and that's really what drives the whole company and the product is of mediocre quality. But right. ultimately in the marketing, the way what they do is they give the impression on TV or in the publications that what they are selling is the best product in the world and ultimately often it isn't. It doesn't get you very far long term. No, no, and that's where, that's, that's I think that's the drawback of the marketing. Often like tell stories that, that you know, you pull wool over people's eyes. So what was the motivation for your parents to come to Canada? I came, for me personally. Uh, was it you that came? <coughs> yeah, came. My, my family oh, never I came. See. I'm the only one that came over. My motivation was that I simply, I wanted to go get into the chocolate business. In Belgium, I had no desire to stay in Belgium. So I looked initially to perhaps go to southern Germany. I looked to the U.S. Yeah. and then I liked I liked it here. I wanted to live close to the mountains and then ultimately that was the decision was made. Right. At that time, that was in, what year was that that you moved to Canada? I moved in November 1982 and that was the time that you had the national energy policy. Right. What was a total disaster so at that time. So people good, think yeah. that now it's bad. I think then it was way worse because people literally left their houses uh, over uh, at night, left the key on the door and yeah. I would simply walk away. Right. Did your parents consider themselves entrepreneurs? Crafts? Yeah, we, we are, you know, my family, we are entrepreneurs. It goes back till 1850, a brewery. We made butter, we made lemonade, and did all kinds of other, uh, of other things. But ultimately, the chocolate company became really the main driver of the, of the family business. But at the time, was that the term that people used? Were they just running their own business? Did they consider themselves a fancy entrepreneurial term? No, it Chocolate. was quite actually, the, the operation was quite large. There were large buildings. The, the brewery was at that time much bigger than my dad made the chocolate company uh, bigger. But when we sold the business, we had 300 employees and we made 30,000 ton a year. 
Was the goal to be your own business owner or was it just something you guys enjoyed doing? Did it start? I, that, that you know, that was something that I'm basically born into it. Right. Like that's that was part of life. You never went out thinking I got to go find a job or something like that. Uh, no, well, my dad <laughs> never forced me to get into the, 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 the family business. Uh, right. He said, you do whatever you want to do. And I think that's the right approach. I think it's wrong to push children into something that you are passionate about it. If they don't have the passion, then, you know, don't do it. Because I think often that, that happens. I've seen that around me, people that get into the family business because it is a family business. But if you don't have the passion for it, definitely if you want to build a quality business in the food industry, you have to be passionate about it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And you were passionate about chocolate always. Yeah, well, when I was younger, it you know, was our playground, etc. Yeah. And ultimately, it became... As you get older, it became more and more, get more and more attached to it and re you realize what you actually have there because chocolate is a very positive business. You're right. in a happy business. I, I say I'm very fortunate. People yeah. come to me and they say like, oh, I love what you make, etc., etc. And, uh, and ultimately, it's a very positive attitude and environment to work in. Have you ever, I'm sure you've read about the C's candies. Yes. Apparently, Warren Buffett bought that company in yes. 1975, around $25 million. Yeah. It makes about $400 million a year now. It's made billions of dollars ever since. Very little capital put into it. What makes candies and chocolate such a good business? Well, it is one of these products that's not going to disappear of the face of the the earth people like chocolate there's definitely chocolate is evolving a lot i think it's going the same way as coffee coffee 30 years ago coffee yeah. was hot brown water 50 cents at the gas station as now you know you have all these sophisticated coffees that yeah. that's on the market and the chocolate is the same thing before it was a candy bar very sugar based lots of sugar in it very ordinary product but now chocolate is becoming a very sophisticated pro uh, product by certain manufacturers i don't say that they are all like that but ultimately you can find very complex very sophisticated chocolate on the market it's such a good business why though like i guess not all chocolate businesses are good in the case of c's candy it was very low capital they take out hundreds of millions of dollars in profit every yeah. year What's your take on that? I can't go in Warren Buffett's head. Obviously, he High has margins. done it. Yes, in a finished chocolate product, like, you know, where you make a finished product, yeah. the, the margins are higher. And that's probably what attracted to him. And, and ultimately, that chocolate is going to be there forever. I mean, he has, uh, what, over 40, uh, basically 50 years that, that he owns. Uh, yes. That's one of his original investments, by the way. Yes. Chocolate is going to be there. I ultimately, I love the product, but and ultimately, you want to make money too, right? But for me, the most most important thing is first to build the base that means that you, you have a solid foundation based on quality because that's what I have built my reputation and ultimately I want to make it better so what I did now in my new company is better than what I did b before so we are building a reputation of our new company and then ultimately you're gonna grow and the money will come that's the way I see it that when you build yeah. a top quality product there will be a demand for it. People will ask for it. And that's where you get the volume. Because cool. ultimately, we are in, in we, we are not much different mm. than any other manufacturing. It's the scalability where you can make the money. Quality first. Is... You do quality first. And I'm, I'm a firm believer. Often people think that when you go in a large production facility, that you have to give up on quality. And I say, if you have the frame of mind to think quality, you can produce in a large scale and produce quality. After the but, fact. Yes, you can do that. But often what happens is in large companies or family business that are taken over and they put them on the public market, they, these people don't have the passion anymore and they are bottom line operators. They look mm -hmm. to that and then it's very easy to cut corners. Right. You know, you have a company, they produce so much chocolate or so much a ton a year and they say like okay let's tweak a little bit the recipe and let a little bit more sugar in it yeah. uh, and if you produce massive amounts that little tweak is 10 million dollars of profit in your pocket po and that's right. where they, a lot of them get trapped and ultimately the quality goes downhill like year after year after year but it goes back to our earlier conversation speaking about marketing and a lot of these companies keep going and are successful because they have massive marketing machines behind them that's where that's really what shows the power of the marketing that even if your product is average with marketing with proper marketing you can sell it there's no doubt about it and make people believe that the product is good getting back to your mom when she sold the business 
was she financially set then? Yeah, and you know, she, she did well. Ultimately, it was her money. She helped us, uh, all three kids, like, you know, to, to, to get going. Ultimately, it was her money. And I always said to my mother, give <laughs> money. So we, we have to sort out our own life. It turned out pretty well for her. Yeah. And you came over to Canada. Your original business, Bernard Calabo. Yeah. You had that business for how long? Uh, 27 years. Did you ever think about selling Bernard Calabo? Or? No, I didn't. I lost it during the recession in 2010. That was a big turn in my life. But I see it in a, in a positive way that out of bad things, good things come out of it. And ultimately, it's an opportunity yeah. to reinvent yourself. When that all happened, what was the revenue like? What was the size of the company? At one point, we had 192 employees. We did $14 million as a head office because then we had dealerships that had their own tours. So in total, we probably did $25 million as a whole organization. But as a head office, because we sold wholesale to the, to the stores, okay. we did $14 million. 2008, things started to unravel. Well, during the recession, yes, the, the, a couple of facts happened. You well, know, what it's, happened? To, to, uh, <laughs> it's a very long story well, to, to explain it. it. But ultimately, I always say, you're the captain on the ship. You made the decisions when, you, when you're on the sea and a storm comes to you. You yeah. can make decisions and try to avoid the storm. And ultimately, I made some wrong decisions. Okay. I had some things that worked against me, like I bought a piece of land. That one of the, the ideas was we were going to build a new facility. The new facility was going to be on Highway 1 and the 22X, where the Petro-Canada station is. And uh, the idea was to do a farm that makes chocolate, because ultimately, after chocolate, our second most used ingredient is dairy products, butter and cream. So we were going to do that built a farm that makes chocolate but then ultimately the whole real estate market uh, collapsed the value of the land was not there anymore and then the bank called the loan we had quite a large line of credit they called the loan you know we were able to raise two-thirds of the, uh, the money at that time but it was not enough and then ultimately th uh, th that was the end of it so it went into receivership and then the receiver sold the business I put an offer in. I was backed by two ladies that were willing to invest. We had an offer in, into the court, and the receiver said that our offer was actually the best for unsecured creditors, but based on a technicality, the judge gave it to the other party, and that was the end of the story. So I had to start all over again, lost the house and everything. Then we started a new company, the 1st of December, 2010, in a sandwich bar, South South Calgary, on Bow Bottom Trail. Landlord said we can use that sandwich bar, and uh, so we made chocolates there, and, uh, and we started selling chocolates right away over leveraged the real estate market crashed yeah but Called ultimately you know that's decisions uh, i always say like no i'm the captain on the ship i could have made decisions that probably would have saved the company because we were still doing close to 10 million dollars in yeah. sales so it's, it's not that uh, <laughs> it's not that we were not selling anything anymore but ultimately you know the responsibility uh, lays on me it's easy to blame the banks etc banks are they are they are like the government, yeah. but they deal with money. I think a lot of people have seen that in oil and gas the last three or four years. Similar situations with banks, right? Where they just call the loans and... They are not entrepreneurs. People have That's a little it. bit of false idea that they are, they are not entrepreneurs. Yeah. They are bureaucrats that deal with money. Exactly. And they have very strict systems, etc. So as business people, often we go by instinct optimism and yeah and uh, and and bankers don't uh, don't operate but ultimately like, like i said before i take the blame on, on myself i said that on dragons <laughs> then i was on dragons then in 2015 and they asked me the question and i said like you know what i'm the guy that's responsible for it right. and that's that's that, that's where the so I've read that some sharks came in and bought the business out of receivership. A group of people that basically... Yeah, well, I knew the guy. Uh, the guy worked for me. He's a, he's a lawyer. He's a litigator. He used to work for the wow. company. Yeah. He worked the guy that... that um, and I'm only guessing because I don't know the, the details that kind of gave him the money to, to, to buy the business. I still think that they, they own it. He's still running it. So, but anyways, I, yeah. I don't know any details about that. And ultimately, it's not my business. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think they're doing very well because I've noticed their Kensington shop closed. I'm sure you've yeah, seen that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't know either. Okay. And like I say, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not involved with them at all. So now there's two Bernard Calibo derivatives out there. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> well, I always say jokingly, they have the name, I have the brain. Absolutely. Right? You know that because you're in a, in a business of passion and knowledge. You, you don't buy passion off the shelf. That's, that doesn't work. You have it in your veins. 
Passion is, you know, I've, I've often thought about what is the definition of passion, because what is true passion? Because you see it on TV all the time, the ad, we are passionate what we do, etc. But that's marketing. People that are truly passionate are people that are obsessed with what they do. And that's people that, that study, research, they put everything in it. And yes, they are probably very boring people to live with because they, <laughs> they are very focused. They are extremely focused what they do right. because that's what their passion is. That's what they want to do. Yeah. That's what their life is about. You know, you don't, you just don't do that. You have to have it and you have to have the knowledge too because it's a combination of both. You, you can be passionate, but you have to have the knowledge and the expertise to make a top quality product. I mean, that's how restaurateurs work. Top chefs go and work for other people and learn. And then they study, them because that, that's part of it too. You keep on studying, like, you know, I study all the, you know, I read books. You, when you're passionate, you keep on learning till the day you go in your graveyard. Are there any key figures, readings, inspiration, philosophies you lean on or? There's all kinds of people that uh, inspire me, like people that go through uh, massive controversies and then ultimately they, they start their life Starting. from scratch again. So I love to read about people like that, yeah. uh, people that, that uh, run into deep trouble or that. Start over. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of uh, one of the things that I've always been uh, following is race car drivers. So there's a, there's a, there's a guy. Uh, Alex Sanardi, he got a big crash, he lost his two legs, and he won a gold medal in the Olympic marathon with, uh, you know, wheelchair races. That's people that they losing your both legs and then get up and yeah. start training and, and become an Olympic athlete. Wow, that's, that's people that they have resilience, extreme willpower. People like that, I find that fascinating to, to read. And uh, and it can be, it doesn't have to be sport, it might be business or uh, other things, people that sacrifice their life. I saw this weekend, my wife and I, we were watching on the BBC, a doctor, an American doctor, and he goes in Africa and he builds a hospital and helps the people. So he gives up a very lucrative career to go and work in the bush and help. And, you know, that, that's that's people like I take my head off. That, that These are really amazing people. Any philosophies? Are you a Stoic? I believe in values, ultimately, <laughs> in, yeah. in, in, you know, values. Business leaders? Any... Uh, yeah, but the, ultimately, respect with people. I think that's how you build a business. It's like, you know, you respect the people, be compassionate. The, I think that's all important in life. That's values that I'm, I teach my children. Starting over Master Chocolates, what was that process like? It's a struggle. It's not not, not easy because ultimately you, you you lose everything. So you start from scratch. Uh, but there is some very positive sides in all that is that there is people that come to you, even people that you haven't seen for a long time, that knock on your door and they they, they are willing to help you. That that's amazing. Like the the, the experience that I have had of people that come and want to help and is absolutely stunning and mm. and that's i never had gone bankrupt i would never have had that experience going bankrupt is not a pleasure trip uh, for the family it's very very difficult you lose your house etc we still suffer on that till in personal bankruptcy myself it's difficult that's uh, that's very difficult but you know you have to look to the future that's that's one of the the, the key things i mm. i focus on the future all the stumble blocks that people put in front of me, you know what, I will deal with it. But ultimately, I'm going to make a successful company and I'm going to focus on that. Yeah. And uh, that's what I do. Every day I do something new. Every day I try another experiment. Yeah. Some of them work, some <laughs> of them don't work. Yeah. But ultimately, it's really focusing on the business and, uh, and make sure that we're going to make it a success. Do you view Master Chocolate as your lifelong work? You're not building the company to flip it three or four years. No, no, I'm not. Uh, you know what I admire is like businesses like Riedel Glass. You know the wine glasses, Riedel. Yeah. It is 1700. Yeah. In the 1700. I mean, sure. I find that fascinating. Yeah. Like uh, businesses that stay. For me, it's not to become the biggest. I want to leave a legacy of building quality. Uh -huh. You know. Hopefully my children will, will fall in love like I did with yeah. the chocolate business. If they don't, you know what? That's their decision. Then hopefully I will find someone that people that work with me might be interested to, to carry on the work. 
I read an interesting book the other day, Small Giants, and the book was all about companies that chose to remain small. Okay. A few breweries, just a variety of companies that could have yeah. grown bigger, yeah. but decided to stay small. Is that viewpoint or? You know, it, it's hard to say. My dad, he always said like, oh, you know, I want to be, become big. And ultimately we did 30,000 ton a year, what is not small, all right? Uh-huh. There was a 24 hour operation, seven days a week, sold chocolate all over the world. And I think if you, you it kind of, takes its own course right. when you make a good quality people will want it and then you but you can control the growth it's not i think that's one of the differences between keeping a company private and taking it public yeah. you have the permanent pressure to grow 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 with a private company you can make long term decisions it might be that a couple of years things are not going like the balance sheets don't look Right. Very great, but ultimately you can have a focus. That's what I you know, want to do it here with, with uh, my team to build something that is sustainable. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Did you ever think about taking the original Bernard Calvo public or was it always? No, no, d- not, not really. No, no. no. You've always been private. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of public companies. No, I can see it when you when you're in a very capital intensive yeah. uh, business going public, that you need to do that. But in, in our case, I pref- I prefer if you can, if you can financially do it as private, because you can really focus on the quality and long term strategies. You can make decisions right away, and there's pros and cons on, on both of them. Right. I would prefer to keep it private. Have you always bootstrapped your companies? Just slowly grown with a bit of debt here and there? Did yes. you take outside investors? Yeah. Or? This company is outside okay. investors like because I didn't have really the, uh, the ownership because I'm in personal bankruptcy. But obviously, I'm, 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 the, I'm the head behind it, right? What advice would you give to people going through that process of kind of starting over any... Starting over, in anything. Is, you know, it's, life, uh, you know, it's, careers. when you start over again is the big advantage that you have is you have a huge amount of knowledge behind you. I had 27 years of knowledge and ultimately in 27 years you make mistakes or decisions that you regret afterwards. Yeah. So you, you have all that knowledge and now you can start from scratch. And ultimately it's a, an opportunity to reinvent yourself start from you have to be more creative because you don't have the means you don't have the dollars to buy all the equipment and you have to be more creative and things like that so there is definitely a positive side to that i was able to make chocolate i didn't even have chocolate molds that i poured the chocolate in, in cookie trays I'm sure there's a lot of people that can relate to that story of restarting everything, especially in Calgary these days with the downturn in the oil and gas sector. A lot of people have been laid off and had to restart. And have you had people come up to you and talk to you about that whole process? Yes, uh, I have people that invite me at university. They ask me, like, you know, are you willing to come and talk how yeah. it is to start from scratch again, etc. If you are truly passionate what you're doing, it you know that's what you want to do, and it's. It gets you out at four o'clock in the morning uh, yeah. out of bed because that's really, that's your calling. Master Chocolate now, what numbers wise, revenue, is it guessing it's not quite in the millions like Bernard Calabo No, was, it's, it's still a small operation. Yeah. We have only, uh, we just opened a second retail of yeah. stores. It's uh, all brand new, but ultimately going the right way. We do also a private label for people. Yeah. Uh, we have people because they know of the quality we do. We do organic, so they come to us. They ask us to make a customized products like you. They know it because of the reputation that we have. And uh, there is more and more, we have more and more uh, people doing that, uh, what is great. Franchising? Are you looking We are not franchising right now. Is that something we might consider in the future? Possibly. Not sure yet. You were on Dragon's Den yes. two or three years ago, I think? 2015. How is that? That is a great experience. I recommend it to whoever wants to do it uh, because ultimately most people fall, uh, most deals fall through afterwards. Right. But ultimately it doesn't matter. The key thing is that you get a huge amount of advertising. People see you. It definitely helps you. Like I highly recommend it. If you ever can do it, do it because it gets you a ton of exposure. I talked to a lot of people that were on Dragon's Den. Most of them, they got a deal, but ultimately after the, the program, the deal didn't go through, through for whatever reason. But they all said that didn't matter. The key thing was that it opened a ton of doors. When you're pitching to Dragon's Den on your company, chocolate is 
it can be somewhat like a commodity. So how did you pitch to the Dragon's Den team your value proposition or what, what made you different? Well, the, you know, chocolate is a commodity, but ultimately when you get into the high-end finished products, it is not. Okay. Because ultimately you put your personal stamp on it. One thing is we are mainly all organic, uh, 95% organic. There's, there's not too many companies that do all chocolates. Like chocolate bars, yes, but we do the truffles and everything okay. is organic and, and of very good quality. That's things that that there is not that many. And we do it at a reasonable price because that's one of the key factors. I always tell the story to, to people. You have the Mercedes-Benz story and you have the Rolls-Royce story. Mm-hmm. Rolls-Royce sells three, 4,000 cars a year. Mercedes-Benz sells $2 million a car a year because they have different price points. There's a, you can buy a small Mercedes for $35,000. And I think that's the key thing. You, you can buy a small box of chocolates. You don't have to spend a fortune, but it's of high quality. That's the key thing. So we keep our prices very reasonable per piece. Like uh, our truffles, like I said, they are 95% organic. They are a dollar twenty a piece. Yeah. You know, they are not five dollars a piece. Right. See, that's what I don't believe in it. If you go to the five six dollars a piece, then suddenly your market becomes very very narrow. As we sell to all kinds of levels of the pu- uh, the public. High value, low price. Yeah, it has to, uh, reasonable. And yeah. I think it, it's really, it's hard in the beginning. When I started in 1983, I lost money the first two years. But ultimately, I hang <laughs> in there and I kept on going. And ultimately, uh, people tried the product because ultimately the best way to for us to advertise, and I still use that technique yeah. today, is let people try it. If you're convinced you make a good quality product, people will find that out and they will taste the difference. You don't have to make a fancy picture, etc. Give them, and we do that. We go, we do tons of trade shows. This weekend we go to the wine show. When you came to Calgary in the 80s from Belgium, that must have seemed like the end of the earth. It's far away, yeah, but that's okay. They, you know that because uh, it was a small city then. Yeah, it was actually when I got here, it was just under 600,000. But ultimately, I believe that with the natural resources that we had here, that ultimately there was a lot of growth coming. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, I think it's a very dynamic city, yeah. even that I think in the long term, there, there is going to be a shift. The demand for oil and gas at one point is going to uh, be smaller. But ultimately, we spoke about Warren Buffett. He is yeah. investing in Medicine Hat. Yeah. He's doing a solar farm. Great. And he's not the only one. So this other, you know, when you have that entrepreneurship in your veins, uh, you're going to come up with other other things. And uh, there will be other industries that will come here. Still, the housing is reasonably affordable compared right. to Vancouver and Toronto. Yeah. Because that becomes a challenge if everything becomes too expensive. To make sure that your team here uh, can find a decent place to live and don't, doesn't have to drive two hours yeah. in the morning and the evening to find an affordable house that is not make doesn't make any sense do you think entrepreneurship kind of runs strong in calgary and alberta versus yes they do so yeah why? no that i i truly believe that there is a very strong entrepreneurship here and and i think that will that will help the city to get over that hump that yeah. the oil and gas industry will I mean, it's not going to disappear because ultimately the world consumption of oil is still going up. But ultimately, electrical cars are not going to disappear. They're mm-hmm. going to be here. Still, we have still to make electricity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not. I love the the stickers on on, on all these cars to say like zero emission. Well, that's not true. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's not true. You have to make electricity. <laughs> so you know. Um, yeah. So, but in I any case, the things are not going to uh, go away. Electricity, electrical cars, etc. But ultimately, I think the city will reinvent itself. Other industries will be here. Was Brett Wilson on the panel when you were on Dragon's Day? No, it was Arlene. Name. Yeah, Arlene Dickinson. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mike, then uh, Jim from the, the, the oh, Boston, yeah. Boston Pizza, and Robert. Then, uh, yeah, he was there, and then the gentleman that owned he has he a restaurateur from Vancouver, very nice guy. Because actually, he said when I turned down the offer, yeah. Mike gave me an offer. And I turned it down because ultimately he wanted to control. And, yeah. I, and I said, uh, no. And he said, good for you. <laughs> it was not shown on TV, but I saw it. Do you ever cross paths? Some of those people outside of the show? Or? No, no. Because you're I kind read, of a I read, famous read, uh, character in Calgary. I've run into Brett Wills at one of the, the cannabis shows. But I've read the book of Arlene Dickinson, like to reinvent yourself. And actually, it's a very good book. Yeah, I saw that. I read that. Actually. It's a very good yeah. book. I read it. it it's a, I recommend it highly for people that are in that place. Uh, it's a very good book. 
as a notorious Calgary character, everyone knows the name Bernard Calabo. How is that? And like everybody do, knows your to, name. When I go to trade shows, often people want to take selfies with me. I mean, I have been around for a long time, like 37 years. Yeah. And ultimately, I have been on billboards, on TV, did commercials. So people recognize you. And it's great. That, that's wonderful that uh, people are they're always very supportive. Rate your back. We love what you do, your new product, etc. So that's very positive. Similar to Rose Bros, you used your own name in the company, or the original company was Bernard Calabo. We yes. called our company Rose Bros Coffee. Did you think using your own name was good branding at the time, or was that just natural? Yeah, I think or? it's good because it it puts at that time, and it, it's good because it kind of gives right away the impression to people that there is an individual behind it, and it's very personal, personalized, etc. Yeah. I think that is very good to do that, but ultimately I cannot do it. Uh, so do. no, I cannot use my name. I can only use my name when I refer to me individual as me the person. I'm the person behind it, so I can do that. But hey, it is what it is, and life goes on. You ever thought about rebuying Bernard Calabo back? But, uh, at this point, I don't know if you can get into that. I, I, I ultimately, I'm, I'm focusing on what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm not even thinking about that. Looking back on your career and as an entrepreneur and business owner, any tips, advice to people just starting out, young entrepreneurs? Uh, you know what? It's an amazing experience, not for the faint of heart. You have to, you, you might run into trouble. I mean, often it happens when you're an entrepreneur, you're going to run into situations, roadblocks, etc. But ultimately, the reward is fantastic. In, in my case, building a reputation was really my biggest asset, huh. but they cannot take that away. That's the thing. They can take my house away. They can take my car away. They cannot take my reputation away. And ultimately, that's where really the value is in it. Even they took my name away, but ultimately that didn't matter that's because amazing. people know that I'm doing other things. Yeah. They will follow that and, be, and they trust when they know that I'm producing it, I'm making the product, people, because of the reputation, trust that the quality will be good. And that's, that's, there's a tremendous value in that. That's something that can never take away. Have you seen that missing from other chocolate competitors or businesses in general? I see, you see that in, uh, in businesses that are taken over, ultimately that drive, that passion is not there anymore. There's corners cut. Right. And you see that often in, uh, in, bu- in any food business, like I'm not speaking about specific one, yeah. I, and in general, you often see that, that that happens. But through marketing, etc., they survive and they grow. Yeah, Some right. of them are massive. Master Chocolate going forward, the plan is to grow slowly. What's the plans for Master Chocolate? I think I read your considering cannabis yeah but that's a different company that uh, we cannot do that under the same roof we are working on that but that's that's not under the master chocolate label which separate that's a totally separate business and it's quite a complex industry like people underestimate it the regulations are quite complex it's not like let's rent a space and and start doing that that's not how it works so the two separate businesses ultimately there is some overlap but they are totally different uh, entities. For Master Chocolat, there's, there's lots of opportunities. We will grow. We have people now uh, knocking on our doors. We, we are working on some big deals, etc. Going back to the reputation. And ultimately, this building helps too. People see, okay, this is this is like a real business, or not somewhere a little box hidden away. That will help to build a brand. Absolutely. Because we are in a brand business, whatever people say you're building a brand that's what what we are doing here for the time being master chocolate is to grow within the city see where things yeah i'm beyond too uh, like i'm going to edmonton like friday so no we are out we will ultimately i don't have any borders limits so yeah. i'm willing to go anywhere online what's your opinion on online online i'm a firm believer in online we do more and more online but i think the brick and mortar is still a portion of uh, of the business because the people can physically see it once they are familiar with the quality that you produce if they are not if they haven't tried it from before because we not forget this every year there's so many people that move into the city they haven't heard from yes. me because they come from Europe or whatever. And ultimately, yeah, that's, there is still a tremendous amount of potential. Well, that's great, Bernard. I really appreciate it. I think we've talked about your history, where Master Chocolate's at now, lessons. Anything you tell people not to do in career and business? Do you have any major roadblocks to avoid? Being well-funded, that's definitely a portion of the business because otherwise it's, it's kind of tough. When, and, and often a lot of uh, okay. businesses fail because they don't have enough financial backing. Know what the, the profession, what you do, that you have a very, that you're very knowledgeable 
what you do. So don't go into something you don't know no, anything about. I, 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 no, I mean, some people do and some people succeed. But I think that that is not the way to go. If you are lucky to do something where you're passionate about it, then the hard work is much easier because ultimately that's what you that's what you want to do. That makes a huge difference. That makes it because ultimately you're going to spend a lot of hours. I was up October, November, December at four o'clock in the morning. And, and ultimately, if you don't have the passion, then then it's hard to hear the alarm clock. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you very much for doing it. Yeah, you're very welcome. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Taking the time. And- Hey everyone, thanks for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. If you liked what you heard, head over to rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming episodes. You can also find our coffee and chocolate there where we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with One Tree Planted, a non-profit organization focused on global reforestation. Otherwise, until next time, happy coffee drinking. <laughs>